Okay, so I would like to uh, welcome you to ICAPS. Um, I'm delighted to see that this room is now filled. Rob and I, uh, maybe about 10 minutes ago, uh, thought we were going to give a presentation to each other. Um, but it leaves time. So, so our ho hosts in Brazil have been really gracious. They put together an incredible, incredible event for us. I hope you like the facilities here. Um, and, and now we're going to kind of engage in the intellectual endeavor. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the spirit of the conference and what we've, what, how we've tried to shape the tutorial programs, the, the, the paper sessions, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit of the logistics and then try to get away as quickly as possible so that we can go into uh, an exciting set of uh, invited, invited talks. Um, just, so the context is I think the first time that I went to ICAPS as an invited speaker was in 95. Um, at that time, the field had made dramatic progress in terms of the original kind of ideas, for example, in terms of block stacking, to kind of defining very well what the planning problem is, laying down the beginning of a formal framework, um, exploring different extensions to that. Um, but we were still planning with about five or six actions. If you look now, then now we're talking about um, through incorporating you know, the planning competition through discipline, we're now able to generate plans with about a thousand actions or more. We're systematically moving from atomic actions to time to continuous and the likes. So the field has made great progress on that. Um, it's also developed its experimental discipline substantially. It's drawn very extensively in pushing search methods where back in 95 there was, it was really backtrack chronolo or chronological backtracking. So we've made tremendous successes in that direction. Um, the question then ends up being is where do we go for the next decade? Um, and what are the directions to push? Any time that a field really excels at one area, right, then your strength, you become strong in that area and then you need to look for new areas in which to strengthen yourself. Um, so in that spirit, we've been trying to do a number of things in the conference to build upon the strong foundation of the conference, but broaden out a bit. Um, one thing that we've noticed, so for example, last year, um, um, you know, there was a set of tutorials on the PR2, and we've seen a bit of a revolution going on in the robotics community right through the availability of stable platforms and then um, robotic operating systems and a lower level set of toolboxes so that you don't have to keep replicating right, your perceptual systems, um, you don't have to write down another inter-process communication system, and then you can incorporate the higher levels. And there's been an amazing adoption um, of these kinds of technologies and sharing of technologies within the robotics community, which complement the kind of sharing that we've had within the planning community through the competition and the sharing of the planners. So that presents us a tremendous opportunity. And then the question ends up being is, how do we take the kinds of planning systems that we developed and how do we incorporate them in embodied systems, real-time systems, and other systems that are embedded in the world? So, and then what we're also seeing is that the opportunity for robotics um, in the real world is becoming substantial. So earlier this week, I visited Embraer and walked through their assembly lines. And I had done this previously with Boeing. And the message that I got at both places were quite impressive. That in the 80s, there was an attempt to incorporate robotics um, within manufacturing. That has been more successful in automotive. But in less structured environments, such as the aeronautics industry, robotics didn't really succeed. Now, during the last four to five years, we've seen a tremendous incorporation of robotics, both within Boeing, Embraer, and other industries. And now they're beginning to shift from saying, how do we have robots that operate alone in safe environments, and then how do we have them start working with human and dealing with more flexible tasks? So I think those are, th that's just one of many of the exciting challenges where planning plays a very significant role. So in that perspective, um, we've had a special track called uh, continuous planning, and then we've carried that theme into our invited talks, our tutorials, and our workshops. Um, so the notion of continuous planning, this term I'm using it as it was kind of originally used in the 90s to mean planning systems that continuously plan, um, execute, monitor, and adapt to the world. Um, and that is viewed as a multidisciplinary endeavor which draws from many different dis disciplines that People now also use the word continual planning to avoid the confusion or the pun with the word, word continuous planning mean planning within the continuous world. But in this case, we are talking about the more larger context of continuously planning, executing in the real world. And there's a wide range of topics. Um, planning at real time, planning with mixed, discrete and continuous domains, planning when the world is not directly observable, um, and the likes. So in order to incorporate that, if 
in just the tutorials and the workshops that you've seen so far, a number of those carry this theme. So for example, there was a tutorial in hybrid systems, estimation, diagnosis, and control um, that uh, Michael Hoffbauer gave. Um, two tutorials on discrete and continuous planning by uh, Scott Sanner, which were both incorporating ideas from model checking and dealing with the mixed discrete and continuous world um, through the use of symbolic encodings. And then Martin Sackbacher had planned a tutorial on model-based diagnosis and execution, which is how do you do reasoning with hidden state, although unfortunately that had to be had to be canceled at the last moment. And then there's several workshops that also have this, this theme of planning execution, which has been a tradition um, explored within the community. Moving towards to the technical program, then we've selected three invited talks which carry forward this theme, drawing people from, from very related fields, both within AI, controls, and robotics. So the first talk today that we'll be, be giving as soon as I get off the stage will be by Rob Ambrose. Um, on controlling robots across intermediate time delays. And that gives the perspective from the robotics community, human interaction, um, and, and space missions. Um, tomorrow, George Pappas will be giving a presentation. Um, George comes from the controls robotics community. And there's been a very strong connectivity in between the controls community and the formal verification community, first, first in the context of verifying um, the trustworthiness of a system, or the convergence, for example, of a system, but now carried into control and planning. So you see a very strong similarity between the use of temporal logic and planning in this community and then within Georgia's community as well. And then Friday, uh, Tony Cohen will talk to us about building qualitative models for spatial temporal behavior. This comes from the knowledge representation community who spent a lot of time looking at qualitative temporal and then spatial representations. Um, and more recently, they've been incorporating these quality of spatial representations, not only in terms of, of basic inference queries, but also in terms of activity monitoring, one of the essential tasks of, of continuous planning and execution. And each morning we'll begin with, with one of those talks. Um, we also had a continuous planning track, um, which carried a number of the themes that I gave you before. And the philosophy behind this track was to draw people from other disciplines. In order to do that, we incorporated many people from a range of different disciplines into our program committee. So people from the hybrid systems control computation community, robotics um, within the AI community, people who do constraint reasoning and reconfigurable systems, right? but real-time aspects. And then a number of related AI communities who are more focused on estimating the state of the world as opposed to generating sets of actions. So the model-based reasoning community, the runtime verification, that's a form of verification community, broad online, Bayesian inference and activity recognition. Um, and then a number of the program committee members you'll have also seen you know, giving, giving um, invited or uh, giving, giving tutorials. Um, and so there will be one, one track of, of papers or one session of papers this afternoon. Um, from the continuous track. Um, and then also, um, this year we have the, you know, the ICKEPS competition. That complements the focus of the IPC on faster kind of planning algorithms. It looks at more of the knowledge engineering context as a whole, including elicitation, modeling, model validation, verification, planning, scheduling, and analysis. And we'll hear a report out of that competition later today. Um, so then going, going to just more generic parts of the program. So if you look at the technical program, then we have 37 full paper presentations. The speakers, remember, you have 20 minutes for a presentation plus five minutes of questions. Um, and the session chairs should be, be very careful to attend to that. We also have a set of short paper presentations, which have, have 15 minutes for the presentation. Uh, that results in 13 sessions, mostly in two parallel tracks with one uh, track for the three best paper prizes, um, two student best paper prizes, and then one best paper prize. Now, if you look at the technical sessions, then here's just the, the list of the different session topics. And you'll notice that the program is really kind of broken into three parts. Um, the, there's four tracks which are focused on increasing the performance right, of our planning systems. As our domains become more and more complex, we have the constant demand for increased performance. Um, there is a range of tracks looking at increasingly expressive planning problems, whether or not we're talking about probabilistic or temporal planning, which we've had, had a tradition of, as well as this planning within a discrete and continuous domain, robot path planning, um, and incorporating techniques from form of verification such as SMT. Um, and then finally, we have, we have two tracks on the application of real-world planning and scheduling and execution within the real world. 
So that's a, ni a very nice healthy program and it's nice to see that now we're expanding the, the level of capability of the, of, planning, of the planning algorithms. Okay, so then to summarize, um, so the special events that we'll have um, are gonna be the, the special track, right? Um, session that you'll see today, um, the ICKPS results session, um, and then at the end of the day, we'll have the doctoral consortium posters and the system demonstrations. Um, tomorrow, we'll have the best paper session and the community meeting, um, which will include the best, um, best uh, thesis dissertation uh, presentation. And then we'll also have the banquet and best reviewer um, prize. And then we'll also have the Festivus, which um, for those people who still remember the Seinfeld, show will then know what a Festivus is. Otherwise, ask um, somebody who has a gray beard um, and find out what the heck it means. Okay, we'll also have an additional special event. There are some people here apparently who like football. And so we will be stopping um, the, taking a pause in tomorrow's events for the, uh, the football game. Okay, so now the logistics. Okay, so in terms of your room, it's fairly easy to navigate around here. 50-50 um, chances that you're going to be wanting to go to this room, right? Um, for sessions labeled A, um, sorry, sessions labeled B, um, and for sessions labeled A, you want to go into Prania. Um, the plenary events will be in this room. Um, the demos and posters will be in Minas Gerais. Um, the lunches will be in the restaurant, Pedra Bella, um, and then the banquet will be in a larger room, Brazil. Okay, last thing for information for presenters, um, please meet your session chair before your session. So in the break beforehand, please talk to them, introduce yourself, um, and at that time, provide them a copy of your slides, right, PDF or PowerPoint. Um, by giving those, you're giving consent to be able to have your slides posted on the, the website for the conference. So if you don't want your materials to be presented, then don't don't provide your material. Please do provide it before you give your presentation because if you defer till later, then you'll forget to do that and you'll remember when you get on the plane. Okay, so then finally, so if you we just kind of recap the schedule, so the highlights of today will be Rob Ambrose's talk, which we're just about to begin. Um, then we'll have three parallel sessions. We'll have the ICKPS competition results, the DC poster, and the system demos. Tomorrow we have a bit of a shift in the schedule to accommodate for the football game. So note that the best paper session will begin at 1.10. The community meeting has been moved up to 2.40, and then the award meeting is gonna be after the football game. Um, and then finally on Friday, we'll have Tony Cohen's invited talk. We'll then um, have two parallel sessions and then say farewell early on. Okay, so, so that's it for the conference. So it's my pleasure to introduce. Oh. Are you getting? Oh. Is this sound still on? Okay, good. So, so it's my pleasure to introduce Rob Ambrose. I've known Rob Ambrose probably for at least 15 to 20 years now. Um, Rob is very well known um, both at NASA and within the robotics community. He received his PhD at at University of Texas, um, and then since then, I believe you've been at at NASA, kind of moving up the ranks at NASA. Right now he's in charge of the, he's a division chief at uh, Johnson Space Center in the division that deals with software, um, robotics, and simulations. Um, he's perhaps best known within the research community for the development of the Robonaut um, robotic astronaut, right, which is a teleoperated, uh, a teleoperated robot in a humanoid humanoid form, um, though, though there's been a constant effort to increase the level of autonomy for that capability. Um, Robonaut 2 is now on the International Space Station, and Rob has also developed surface versions of, of Robonaut called uh, Centaur. Um, Rob has also been kind of very actively involved in automation for, for human space flight, orbital robotics, and the likes. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Rob. Well, 
thank you very much and good morning. And thank you, Brian, for inviting me. I'm looking forward to uh, catching a pulse on uh, where planning is and how it might be applied to our, our work back at NASA. I'm talking today about how to control robots across intermediate time delays, and I'll get into what I think that an intermediate time delay is. But it's a uh, general pursuit that we've had for a number of years, uh, and going back into ancient times, wanting to operate across time and space. Uh, before I start with that, I just want to put uh, uh, a word in for an initiative that I've been working with several other agencies, uh, NSF, NIH, and USDA, something called the National Robotics Initiative. Uh, we're in the process of issuing the first rounds of grants uh, from each of the four agencies, and we're going to be doing another round next year. Uh, this has been a great uh, opportunity for me to work with the other agencies. One of our agreements is that we'll share research results, so it's a, um, it's a, it's a great opportunity for us. About a year ago, um, President Obama announced this initiative at Carnegie Mellon University, and he told some uh, pretty funny robot jokes. Uh, as long as they're, they're laughing about robots, we're always happy that they at least mention them. So, uh, controlling across time and space. Uh, it's a, been a long-term pursuit. Uh, it's, it's very useful. Uh, we think at NASA a lot about um, uh, great distances of time and space. Um, but in uh, the ancient world, um, this really was a military problem. And it started um, in mid-500 BC. Um, King Cyrus was really the first uh, ruler to have such a problem. Uh, his empire had grown, it was enormous, uh, and he, I guess, was um, not wanting to distribute control across his empire. Uh, he summered in one part of the empire and he wintered in another part, and so what he did was he built this royal route, and along the route he staged uh, horsemen that could take information up and down the route, and that allowed him to constantly receive feedback across his entire empire, and then issue commands and, and run the, the empire, even though it was 2,500 kilometers across. Uh, not long after him, and in uh, conflict with Persia, uh, were, were the, the various Greek armies. Uh, maybe they weren't as powerful as the Persian army, and so they had to be a little craftier. Uh, so in the way they sent messages, uh, they were a little stealthy about it. Uh, they would take a person and shave that person's head and then tattoo on the head uh, a message and then wait for the hair to grow back. So these are messages that are being sent. Uh, later in the talk, we'll be talking about millisecond level kind of response. Here they're waiting for a guy's hair to grow back as they send the message. Um, but this was the state of the art in how to do command and control. A few hundred years later, the Romans were conquering, again, great um, tracts of land. And as they got to Britain, they were really at the end of their logistical abilities. And so they started building these things called signal towers. Uh, they, again, wanted to be able to command fairly tactically, tactically these armies in the field. And so they built these uh, flag towers that were connected by line of sight and they could issue commands and get feedback on um, how things were going. Uh, one of the key innovations here is they were using text level symbols and so they could encode pretty sophisticated messages. But again, they had to bounce the message from flag tower to flag tower uh, across hundreds of miles. Encryption became more sophisticated in uh, the 1400s, uh, Italian inventor uh, Battista Alberti invented the cipher disk, um, a pair of concentric wheels with different alphabets that would allow him to encode messages. But again, they were transcribed by hand and then carried by people. Um, by the 19th century, Thomas Jefferson in America was doing the same thing. He had um, modified the idea to something called the cipher wheel. Uh, many more alphabets involved. Uh, harder to crack, but again, carried by hand. And uh, these were letters that Thomas Jefferson was writing to his friends, and they were having to be carried by horsemen. And then things really started to take off. By the end of the 19th century, uh, Nikola Tesla had come to the United States and was remote controlling boats. 
amazing. About the same time Marconi was doing Morse, uh, Morse code, in fact, within about a year or so of that, um, Tesla set up a exhibition at Madison Square Garden and had a boat and would call out to the crowd, what would you like it to do? And someone would say something and he would type and the boat would do it and it was wireless. And the US Patent Office refused to issue his patents until they came and observed the boat because they thought that it was impossible. Uh, this was a major breakthrough, in fact, probably too much of a breakthrough. It was combining too many things all at once. This ability to communicate wirelessly was itself incredible and the ability of a machine to run on electricity on its own, uh, remarkable, uh, connecting them together was maybe a step too far. Uh, in fact, um, he went even further. Um, into the early 20th century, um, he speculated about the future and um, was dead on. He, his first thought was that we will eventually build these things that he called uh, teleautomata, and the tele meant that it was controlled by somebody else. He referred to this as a robot that had borrowed a brain. So it was borrowing the brain from the person who was teleoperating it. But he said that was just the beginning, that eventually these machines would become more sophisticated, and that the most important part of that sophistication would be the equivalence of a human mind, so that the machine would be able to uh, behave as a human does, so that you could anticipate its actions and you could program its actions. Uh, he was um, famous for making some fairly outlandish statements in the press, and here's a couple good quotes. One was talking to a, a reporter, he said, you do not see here a wireless torpedo. You see they're the first of a race of robots, mechanical men, which will do the laborious work of the human race. Now this was more than 100 years ago. He spent about a decade trying to convince the, the admirals in the US Navy to pick up these things that actually were wireless torpedoes, and they didn't buy. Um, at the time, the, the world was going through the construction of battleships, and proposing something that could take down a battleship was very unpopular. Uh, he even brought in Mark Twain, who's Samuel Clemens, as his front man. And even with Mark Twain, he couldn't convince the admirals that they needed to look into this new technology. So by 1907, uh, there's a quote in the New York Times by Tesla saying, the time is not yet ripe for the tall automatic art. And he was right. He was 100 years early, maybe not quite. But the admirals were wrong. And just a couple decades later, uh, they were discovering that their giant <coughs> ships and their battleships were being sunk by very small boats carrying torpedoes. Uh, and again, being able to command across time and space was critical to this. In World War II, the, the German Navy wanted centralized control. So as, they would as a submarine would detect an enemy convoy in the Atlantic, they would radio back to the mainland and report the coordinates. And then the mainland would send out signals to all the other submarines, and they would coordinate together and attack all at once on one command in something that they called wolf pack tactics. Uh, so this was an incredible achievement to be able to control boats all the way across an ocean to all work together. But it was also the, the downfall of the tactic. Uh, even though they had an incredible encryption system, by then they had built the Enigma machine to encrypt their commands, the, uh, the Allied navies started to use direction finders. So they, they couldn't tell what the message was saying, but they could tell it was coming from over there. And so there must be a sub over there. And that was the downfall of these subs that uh, even smaller machines called aircraft could fly off and attack the sub uh, as soon as it uh, used its radio. So again, being able to command and control people and machines across great distances is an important capability, not just militarily, but uh, in a lot of domains. A couple decades later, we really got to some pretty sophisticated machines 
uh, one of the first unmanned aircraft um, uh, was built in the, the 1960s. It was not what I would call a robot. Uh, it was not radio controlled because we had learned the lessons of radio being a, a telltale. Uh, it was merely a wind-up toy. It was pre-programmed to fly, but it flew at Mach 3. So that's a pretty good wind-up toy. And it was deployed from the back of an A-12, which was a lot like an SR-71, also going at about Mach 3. So that's a pretty effective machine, and it could fly for thousands of miles. Uh, it was unmanned. It would fly a one-way trip, and before crashing, it would eject its, uh, its data for mechanical recovery. Later in that decade, we were starting to build some of the first unmanned spacecraft. And here we were wanting them to do more than just timed events. Uh, there were a number of important timed events, like mid-course corrections, but there needed to be some kind of a sensing or some kind of an adaptation that had to be done by the spacecraft, and there was no person there to do it. And it was at a distance where trying to command it from Earth um, was awkward. In particular, uh, the most important dynamic event was landing, knowing when to turn the engine off and knowing when not to turn the engine off. Um, landing is a very difficult thing, and if you try and do it in a completely pre-programmed way, uh, it's quite dangerous. So the surveyor missions were uh, tremendously successful. A few of them failed, but we learned a lot, and this was really the precursor, the robot precursor program for Apollo. Uh, it demonstrated mid-course corrections, demonstrated the communication system that would allow us to get data from and send commands to a deep space spacecraft, and then demonstrate that moon landing. It, it also busted a number of myths about how the moon was made of soft dust, and when landers would land, they would sink up to their antenna. It busted all those myths as well. And then we, um, we went to the moon with people, uh, and towards the end of the Apollo program, we sent this amazing machine called the, the Lunar Rover. Um, it had on board it uh, one of the, the best early tele-robots. Um, it wasn't designed to be driven robotically. You couldn't steer it and, and control the propulsion from mission control but you could control the pan tilt unit on the camera. So uh, um, it was an amazing camera too. It was maybe the precursor to the camera in the back of the room, a small handheld miniature TV station that the astronauts could walk around on the moon with, uh, but also having this camera that could be controlled from Houston with a, uh, a pan tilt uh, mechanism. They decided to use it as a, as a cameraman. And at the end of the Apollo 15 mission, they parked the rover a safe distance away. And as the ascent module left the surface, they tried to follow it with this camera. And they missed completely. You know, it went and then the camera looked and it was too late. So then they tried in Apollo 16 again, and again they missed. So by Apollo 17, and that was looking like it was gonna be our last mission, they definitely wanted to film this departure, and so they built a lookup table and a person at mission control using time on a sheet of paper issued commands through the comm system to try and lead the ascent of the, the ascent module. And there, you can go to YouTube and see this clip. Um, it, it finally worked on the third try. Um, Now, uh, Sheridan, who was doing his graduate work at the time, could have explained to him, you know, that's just not the way to do it. Uh, you've got the time constants associated with this pan tilt camera, which are down in you know, sub-seconds. And you're trying to track it with a camera signal that's got three, four, five seconds of time delay. That's never going to work. Uh, so what they ended up doing was just pre-programming it, and they could have pre-programmed it at the, at the robot. And they could have just triggered on an event and using the clock that it had, it could have swept the pan tilt. They chose to do that with people in the loop. Um, Sheridan was probably busy finishing his PhD and not, not trying to fix that at the time, but he did some really 
important work back then at looking at how time delay affects teleoperator control loops. And by the 90s, uh, that had uh, really um, solidified a pretty good understanding of, of what you can and can't do across time delay. And it's, it's important to note that um, he was really looking at human arms controlling robot arms doing human-like manual dexterity tasks. But that was really the focus of the work. And it's, it's probably more general than that. You know, for that class of work, he was saying more than about 50 milliseconds of time delay would prevent you from doing a good job uh, trying to do teleoperator work, especially if you try to, to do what's called bilateral force feedback, where you're transmitting forces back and forth across the, the time delay. 50 milliseconds was about the limit that he felt that we should push. Um, but more generally, it's about the time constants of the system. So for example, if the system was a machine to cut a blade of grass, and you would wait till the grass grew to a certain height, and then at that moment, you would clip the blade of grass. The time constants in that system are so slow that a one hour time delay would probably be okay. That as long as the time delay is, is um, much smaller than the time constants, you can have all the command and control go back through the, uh, the remote site and, and still do a good job. Um, it just happens that in eye-hand coordination, the time constants are very short, and 50 milliseconds um, was a, a good benchmark that uh, Sheridan showed us. So we had, of course, um, learned this uh, by the time we sent Sojourner to Mars, and we weren't trying to control this machine through time delay, puppeting it like a telerobot. Uh, furthermore, we were going to Mars where time delays, depending on the way the two planets are aligned, can range from four minutes round trip out to 40 minutes. Uh, trying to do a synchronous control with a person in that loop uh, across that kind of time delay uh, doesn't make a lot of sense. So um, by 96, we, rec we recognized that we had to endow the machine with certain abilities on its own to be able to make decisions, to be able to uh, uh, control in a, a synchronous feedback control system and take care of business, and then we would interact with it in a more asynchronous way. Uh, in fact, the way the, the rover was commanded was with FTP, where the rover would sit and look at a, at a directory, and when a file appeared that had the right name, it would open the file, and if the header in the file had the right words, it would do what, fo what followed. And then it would, at the end of the day, FTP back all sorts of great data that it had collected, uh, pictures and, and other uh, sensor data. Uh, fairly discrete interactions, um, but uh, effective. And what was key to that was the rover could protect itself. Uh, it was not dependent on a person in a synchronous loop looking out for dangers. It could detect those dangers on its own and avoid them. Uh, this machine ran for about three months. Um, even with the fairly high level interaction, it was hard on the people and um, there were a lot of lessons learned about how to form up a team to command and interact with a, uh, a machine like Sojourner and there was a number of important lessons learned there. Because humans have dynamics too. Uh, back in the 50s, Fitz showed all sorts of problems with putting lags in systems with people um, just starting to make mistakes. And uh, that's not just in kind of the eye head and coordination area either. It's also cognitively. If you issue a command every five minutes, that's just long enough to kind of get detached from the context of the system. Uh, this would be a good point to inject your favorite uh, attention span joke about kids these days. But it's, it's really true just about humans in general that trying to engage a system where you're interacting with it in a very discreet and um, um, you know, with long intervals is, is hard on people and we're not very effective at it. So around 2004, uh, NASA turned its attention back to the moon. 
Uh, the moon has been very patient. It's been approximately where it was in the 60s, uh, waiting for us. Uh, I feel like um, uh, the moon is inevitable. Uh, as we build systems to go out into the universe, we only have one moon. If our planet had two or three, I think there would be a lot of debate about where we would go next. But we've only got one. And uh, like a people that are living on the shore of a, a giant ocean and there's only one island on the horizon, we're curious about that island. And it seems like a good place to start as we would explore the ocean. Similarly, the moon. The moon is about 1.26 seconds speed of light uh, from a normal point to a normal point between the two spheres of the Earth and the Moon. So a round trip, if it were perfect, would be about two and a half seconds. But what we do is we don't run an antenna around the Earth trying to stay directly below that point on the Moon. And the explorer on the Moon is not directly at that point either. So by the time you bounce um, signals through uh, geosync satellites and uh, route them between the various NASA centers and get them to the people, you should expect more on the order of about a 10 second round trip time delay. So you know right away from Sheridan's work, we're not going to be doing fine teleoperator control. But you also could imagine only talking to a robot once a day might feel a little coarse. Uh, talking to the, the science teams and the robotics teams working on the Mars rovers, I found that there was a, a desire for more interactivity on the part of the, the command team. And here was our opportunity. Unlike Mars, which was tens of minutes away, here we would have tens of seconds of delay and we might have an opportunity to try something new. So we were looking for an intermediate approach. It's not going to be low latency, uh, high uh, bandwidth teleoperation because the time delay just won't make that possible unless we're doing incredibly boring and slow things on the moon. And it's not going to be sending a message and then waiting to see what happens tomorrow. We want something in the middle. And so our analogies to this are supervision where a supervisor is interactive with the subordinate, directing but not controlling. By that I mean com uh, giving commands in an asynchronous way, but letting the subordinate do what it needs to do to do a good job. So this is something that we've started to call a supervisory level of autonomy from the robot's point of view and a super supervisory level of control from the c human commander's point of view. So in 2004, we looked at what was the best we had in teleoperation, and we had some pretty remarkable abilities. If you have no time delay, you can do some pretty amazing things. So here's a video of the Robonaut 1 system handling one of the hardest things astronauts have ever used in space. This is the, uh, the torque tool that was developed for repairing the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, Mike Massimino and Nancy Curry had just come back from a, a shuttle mission and they, they had it very fresh in their mind and they came over and they coached a teleoperator who had never handled these tools and this was the first try. Um, Mike said, here's what you got to do, you got to hold it with one hand because you don't want to scratch the Hubble and it's really um, hard to see but look for this little hole that rotates around periodically and Nancy's job inside the shuttle was she would count the hole using a camera and try and keep track of the progress as they were unfastening these, these fasteners holding the, the Hubble's doors closed. Um, Mike also had a bunch of tricks. He uh, showed us that you know, his fat human finger couldn't fit in to get that bolt out uh, because he's wearing this big space suit. So he said use the tool as as a way to get that bolt out. Since you've already got the tool on it, just tap it and um, you can get it out more easily. And then the next step was you have to pull these so-called pit pins where you have to depress a button and then you can extract it. And they're going through a couple plates. And Mike said the problem was 
they would get misaligned, you just have to jiggle it. it turns out jiggle it is one of the most important robot functions and um, it's, it's pretty good for people too. And he said, you know, the, the pit pins are tethered so they won't fly off, but keep an eye on it because it'll wrap around your wrist and you, you, you've got to uh, keep an eye on those tethers. So we went through the whole procedure with him and this was all teleoperated. What I really wanted was a robot with a person. And so we did a number of experiments, again, with a teleoperator. And this was from like 2004. I was doing soldering with a tele-robot. So soldering is kind of a four-handed task. I had the robot hold the two wires, and then I would hold the soldering iron and the solder. And the four hands together could solder the wires. And I would just talk to the teleoperator and gesture and, and point and the teleoperator would talk to me and it was just like my buddy Fred was inside the suit um, and it, it worked extremely well um, but again this is teleoperated so unless you've got really good time delay you're not going to be able to do uh, that kind of um, function so then we started to look at higher levels of autonomy in the, the Robonaut 1 system here again, we were doing a, a two-agent task where we've got Dr. Bill Bluthman on one end of a strut and Robonaut 1 on the other, and they're trying to maneuver the strut to feed it through a, a slot. And we tried lots of different ways to do it. Uh, we tried um, voice command, where you would command Robonaut to do what it needed to do. You're not synchronously controlling it now. You're just giving it direction. We tried using arm gestures to point in the direction we would like it to move. And then we used haptic loads where the person on one end of the stick would just push the stick and the robot would sense the forces and kind of go with the flow uh, responding to the, the commander. So this was some of our early work beyond teleoperation with the Robonaut system. Uh, it, it really needed some important um, capabilities like human tracking. This was you know, eight years ago before the Kinect came out. We thought it was pretty cool, um, but it wasn't very robust, and I just was confident somebody else was going to be investing in that technology, and I'm glad they did. And we've now been working with the Kinect a lot, working with Xbox. But you see in kind of an inset there, there's a, a model um, of what a person might look like and trying to segment out the person's head and the person's hand and use the, uh, the distances between them to uh, take the command. Let's just move on. So we had some basic autonomies that were being developed and so we were thinking about how to do supervision, supervision from the remote side, and uh, we we built a uh, an immersive environment where a person could step into the robot in a kind of a graphical sense and start to operate on objects. And as long as the robot would perceive those objects and had the ability to handle those objects, you could do a lot with that. So the um, the graphical environment was driven by where the robot thought objects were. And it was um, a pretty effective system that would allow us to handle easily 10 seconds of delay and stay ahead of the robot. Uh, it was predicated on some really good autonomies in the machine. So here's a, 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 one of Rod Gruppen's students. This is Rob Platt, who's now at the um, University of New York, Buffalo, uh, demonstrating what we called the uh, uh, distal reflexive curl where various objects um, are detected and the robot would just grab them like an infant grabs an object when you, when you put your finger in an infant's hand the infant's fingers curl around it. Uh, this meant that it was adapting to the shape of the object and you didn't have to do that you could just say grab it and it would grab it. It also had to be able to identify where those objects were uh, it had to identify what the object was. Uh, here again, using an early stereo vision system, we could identify tools 
and then more importantly we could estimate their pose in XYZ roll yaw pitch. Uh, we also built a um, data system called the Sensory Egosphere. Uh, this was developed by Alan Peters at Vanderbilt and one of his key students, Kim Hambuchen, who then came to JSC. Uh, the Sensory Egosphere, um, according to Peters, acts a lot like the hippocampus in the human brain. Uh, that's the lobe of your brain that is surprised when you turn and find the tool you were just using isn't there anymore that it's keeping track of all the objects and the, the individuals around you. And uh, that became a very important data structure for us. Um, and we used it to drive our, our uh, virtual world that we were using to command the machine. So we started to build overlays and we would have the most recent data that coming back from the time delay as a, as a graphical image. Um, and then overlay skeletons of where you would like to command the system. And we started to look at both manipulation and roving. And so these are two of the big dichotomies in robotics, manipulation and roving, rovers, mobility, tend to be the two main areas. And so we wanted to make sure that what we were thinking about was not too um, specific to either of those. So throughout the rest of the work, uh, for the last 10 years, We've had a nice mix of both manipulation and mobility systems being commanded. Now take a look, uh, if, if you're familiar with NASA, you, you would re realize how amazing this slide is. Um, Kim Hambuchen uh, built this thing called the Predictive Interactive Graphical Interface, and she integrated it with software from JSC um, for the simulations, uh, from Ames for some of the 3D visualization and using a, the Ensemble uh, software suite from JPL. This is you know, the equivalent of a hat trick uh, to be able to pull this off. Uh, it's been a tremendous team combining engineers from all three of those centers and um, one of the, the best center center teams I've ever dealt with in my life. Uh, that's actually a picture of Kim uh, at, the, at the command there. Uh, the Piggy system uh, allows these cues of commands to be sent and queued at the robot uh, and all sorts of insight into the state machine that's running on the robot and where you are in it so that you can operate on the state machine, edit it, and basically control execution even across time delays. With a focus on the moon, we started doing a number of field tests. Uh, here was one of the first ones in 2006. Uh, these field tests were a group called the Desert Rats, and we would go out to um, rough environments and test our mach machines. Uh, here is a picture of uh, one of the first tests. Uh, that's one of the Robonaut 1s mounted on a Centaur rover, uh, working with a JPL robot called Athlete, which had multiple limbs. Same software being used to command both, even though the machines are very different. Then by 2008, we had started to build a new class of rovers that were scaled for um, people. Uh, so we, we conducted an experiment comparing two kinds of rovers. If you were going to go to a planetary surface, um, what kinds of machines should you take with you? Well, we, we developed two uh, classes. One was called an unpressurized rover, and the other was called a, a pressurized rover. And the unpressurized rover, we mounted the astronauts on these turrets, and then, hence the name chariot for the chassis. Um, the astronauts would be in the suits for about eight hours, and that's pretty tough on the human body. What we found is that putting them in a, a pressurized cabin and letting them go out only for short intervals was a much better, uh, much more productive uh, approach. Uh, they could get in close with good visibility, even sensors that are better than human visibility. They could decide where to park and then get out of the cabin and, and do a spacewalk. This was a huge breakthrough. As the, the astronauts were driving in Apollo, it was very hard to operate in a spacesuit. The spacesuits don't bend well. They had a winch that literally crushed the suit down so that they could see over the sill of the suit as they were sitting in a seat. They were bouncing, and we were thinking they weren't doing a lot of observation. Uh, 
they were just trying to survive as they were driving that vehicle. So this was a huge breakthrough. Uh, being able to separate suits off quickly and do like a 30 minute EVA was one of the key enabling technologies here. We built this thing called the suit port where the suits stayed outside and then would separate off. You would climb into them through a pair of hatches and then you'd close the hatch on the cabin and a hatch on the suit and then separate. Instead of going for say uh, four or eight hours through an airlock, instead of having to depressurize the entire cabin where it would get filthy, instead of bringing the suits back into the cabin covered in dust, um, this approach allowed the astronauts to, to get out very quickly and do an effective spacewalk. And here you'll see uh, when they climb back in, they plug their spacesuit in, and from the inside, they climb back into their cabin. Maybe a little sweaty, but not covered in moon dust. So we didn't tell the astronauts, but those rovers they were driving, um, they're actually robots. Uh, they were built to be driven completely robotically, and we spent a lot of time when they weren't watching out in the field driving them from Houston. Even though we were out in Arizona, we were using the same command and control software that we were using for Athlete and the K-10 rovers at Ames. And it's a, an evolving suite of tools that um, is coordinated with Piggy. So down in the lower right, you'll see some, some graphics and interaction that look a lot like the planning software that JPL uses to plan out the next day in a rover's mission. But instead of working it and then FTPing it after you get it right, the robot's are running. So you're out ahead of it in execution. 